Right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Charlie Chan Rotspan, and I'm the uh, class chair of the 2007 Reunion Committee. Oh, it's great to see many of you here today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this session, Entrepreneurship, Identifying, Valuing, and Capturing Opportunities. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Vince Ponzo from the class of 2003. He's the managing director of the Entrepreneurship Program at the Eugene Lang Entrepreneurship Center. You can read more about him and our featured alumni and panelists on the information sheet that was distributed to you today. I was asked uh, to introduce this session. I'll also give a brief overview of my experience in entrepreneur entrepreneurship and my story. Um, so Columbia Business School has meant a lot to me, uh, personally and professionally. Um, I've had a lot of great memories here. Uh, professionally, I'm the founder and CEO of a global accessories chain called uh, Charming Charlie. When I started in Columbia in 2006, um, I had three stores and I read founded the company. Um, my, entrance, my entrance essays for Columbia were based on entrepreneurship and how I could take my small startup business and acquire the skills to build a national chain. Today I'm proud to say we uh, operate, we went from three stores to 380 stores and we operate in eight countries globally. Um, we focus on selling our customers fun, color and entertainment. Our products in our stores are fashion, jewelry, accessories and gifts. During my time at Columbia, I shamelessly offered my company for case projects, got a lot of free strategic consulting from my peers, every class I could offer. Actually, I was looking at some of the decks yesterday that from managing a growing company from, from 10 years ago, it made me smile. Spent countless office hours with professors asking them for advice. Um, now that's pretty good value and, and super excited and, and have such a great affinity to the school. Personally, my cluster mates from Cluster Y um, have become lifelong friends and many of us keep in touch today and still have our annual um, trips together. Uh, bottom line, I feel very fortunate, feel privileged uh, to have attended such a great business school. Kindly note that today's session is being videotaped and will be posted on your reunion website after the weekend. And I'll turn the floor over to Vince and let's give him a hand. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, and thank you everybody for coming out this morning. Um, I know it's early on a Saturday, so it's, it's great to see so many people here. Um, this panel is always one of the highlights of, of my year. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, I graduated in, in 2003, and I miss school so much and reunion so much that I now get to come back every year and do it. Um, this is an amazing panel that we have. It's a shame that we only have an hour. Um, I, I personally know everybody on the panel. They've been great, uh, great alumni, great supporters of the Lang Center, and we're going to have a really good conversation today. So we'll speak for about 40 minutes or so, and uh, we'll leave about 15, 20 minutes for audience questions towards the end. So you have 40 minutes to, to think of a good question or two. Um, so I think best way to start before we go into any questions is if everybody on the panel could just maybe take a minute or two to, uh, to introduce yourselves and just talk briefly about what your, uh, what your entrepreneurial endeavor is. Oh, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Tom Flickinger. I'm a grad of Cornell University in 82 and came to Columbia in 87 uh, to get my MBA. I uh, grew up in Buffalo, New York, for anybody who is a Western New Yorker. Um, I got started really thinking about entrepreneurship when I was about eight, when I wanted to get into the family business, which was a food wholesaling company in Buffalo uh, called SM Flickinger. And that was, uh, it was about the, let's see, it was here in New York when it got sold out from under me, because I always wanted to go into that business and, and uh, build it to something uh, even bigger than the two billion it was, and uh, got here at uh, Columbia and changed paths and got into marketing and continued to market uh, after I left with Quaker Oats on Aunt Jemima, uh, Gatorade, uh, left there to work for Life Fitness um, in various companies only to find myself working in audit and tax marketing for KPMG. So, uh, Nothing against KPMG, but from food to tax products uh, really gave me the impetus to move on and um, start my own business. Um, I'll be talking later, uh, I'm sure, about the whys, but um, i just leave you with this. If anyone in this room is thinking about starting a company, um, leave the paperwork and all the business plans aside at some point and just go for it because I spent a lot of time on the business plan. It was good, 
and at some point you just have to go for it and um, I was lucky enough to to have a good partner and be in a position to start a company that is now 12 years successful, uh, more of a logistics company than anything else. We move wine around the world for collectors, average bottle price about 120 bucks, and uh, Providence being key, and uh, it's been a really, really fun job um, after working for various big corporations. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks. Good morning. Um, hi, I'm Nina Tandon, and um, I'm also from New York. My mom's from Buffalo, I'll yes. say. I am from Roosevelt Island, New York, zip code 10044, and I <laughs> am one of maybe the only people who, as an adult, lives in the same zip code she grew up in, so just throwing that out there. Um, my family growing up, in many ways, was my first example of entrepreneurship. We had a virtual kind of babysitter's club going where we owned the Roosevelt Island market because there were four of us. Uh, we could do parties, we could do, <laughs> you know, date nights, all of, all of the above. Um, and they were also in many ways my first research group. So I'm one of four kids. Um, my two sisters are colorblind and my brother is night blind. Um, and these are both conditions that result from small mutations on the X chromosome. Um, so from a very early age, um, I was exposed to this idea that very small changes in our DNA can lead to very profound differences in how we view the world and how we... Um, our, our physiology, essentially, right, the, the, our bodies. Um, so followed that professional preoccupation through electrical engineering and eventually through biomedical engineering. I did my PhD at Columbia here as well. And during my postdoc years, after a stint at McKinsey in their healthcare and med devices pro, um, uh, group, um, came here for a postdoc in biomedical engineering. So I did my postdoc in parallel with my MBA here at Columbia. So I'm like, well, very, very school pride, Columbia. Um, Columbia has been wonderful as we spun out our company. We grow bones from stem cells and cartilage as well and hope to um, alleviate the need for, um, well, bone after blood is the most transplanted human tissue. So we're hoping to um, address that need because even, you know, even though we need, we have bones for millions of these procedures, we're the only way to get human bone, even now, is to cut it out of a human. So we grow those in the lab. Um, Columbia has been a wonderful place, you know, supporting us educationally and also um, entrepreneurially. One of, one of my dear professors and mentors, at least, is in the audience. And um, several of our classmates have become investors, including Dean Hubbard himself. So lots and lots of school pride we could talk about um, here at this, for me at least, in this panel. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Esther Mark, class, class of 92. Thanks for having me, and it's great to see some fellow classmates, past faculty members, mentees. Um, so I'm from Hong Kong, and I like to call myself a mom entrepreneur with an adult ADHD syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Having two kids, two businesses, and a retired husband. So um, I went to UC Berkeley, studied economics, came to Wall Street, worked on this famous mortgage-backed securities with Citicorp Investment Bank, really hated it. So I took the subway here to Columbia Business School, sat in a few classes, shook some hands, and luckily got in. Um, so I studied management and marketing, and that really opened my, you know, my horizon. That's really my cup of tea. So I was very lucky to um, land a job with Procter & Gamble back in Hong Kong, and that was just when P&G bought Max Factor. So I was assigned to this SK2 brand, you know, glamour and beauty and skin care. So we did a lot of PR. So I ended up actually doing most of the PR for SK2 instead of using Bursa Mostella. Uh, no offense. So I said, wow, that's really my area of interest. You know, I love writing. I love coming up with um, gimmicky ideas. I love creating things. I love doing events. And I love to, you know, teach people, you know, how to do facial and massage and all that, you know, coming up with uh, creative names for different products. So after five and a half years with PNG, I started my own, Prestige Limited. 22 years ago, so we're a boutique lifestyle company serving lifestyle clients, anything except a finance IPO, finance PR. So we basically do everything related to lifestyle, including beauty, products, uh, education. Uh, we do a lot of charity dinners, a lot of gala dinners, a lot of fundraising, uh, kids' education, cars, jewelry, fashion, you name it. And just eight months ago, I just couldn't stop, you know, um, having a retired husband who loves sports, and I'm very into sports. My two daughters are competitive swimmers and squash players, so I started uh, Harvest Sky, which is a sports education and management company, to really try to identify 
nurture and harvest the talents of elite and underprivileged athletes in Hong Kong. So I get to talk about those more later. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. This, is this on? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's uh, certainly an honor to participate on this panel. My name is Yael Alkali. I graduated in 1997. Uh, the name of my company is Red Flower, and I actually have the honor of being the first company founded uh, or with seed capital from the Lang Center, the Lang Fund. So Columbia actually owns a share in my business, and uh, we are uh, thrilled and honored to have, uh, have participated so much in what entrepreneurship means for the school. And I think my story is, uh, like everybody else's, unique to my own family background. Uh, my parents are not from the United States. I was the first person born here. And uh, the zip code that I now call home is 10012. My business is based here in New York City. Uh, we produce and manufacture ourselves in greater New York. So we are very New York centric and I think that is part of the Columbia background. Red Flower was founded really on a very simple and important and more and more relevant idea around uh, living life more fully. While I was at, my, uh, at Columbia University, I had a, a health crisis and uh, got through it really partially coming to the awareness that something as simple as you know, the scent of uh, an essential oil could lift your spirits and make you feel whole. And I was uh, at, a, at a Columbia event just two nights ago, and uh, I think uh, you're here in the audience, somebody shared with me that one of the, the biggest uh, growing interest in the Columbia Business School uh, program right now is actually a mindfulness class. When I started Red Flower, um, I was really focused on the idea of beauty being something internal, of taking a moment for yourself to decompress and de-stress, of shifting your attitude. And those ideas were very new at the time. I think without Columbia, I would really not have been able to push the beauty space and transform the ideas that have become so relevant um, today. So, Thank you. That's Red Flower. That's a little bit of my background, primarily in the beauty space, and uh, really pushing those ideas forward today, uh, shifting from an industry that is focused on the thank you on the external to an industry focused on the internal, on feeling great from within. Thank you. Morning, everybody. I'm Brian Rich. I'm with Catalyst Investors here in New York. We're growth equity investors, which our flavor of venture capital is investing in companies once they already have a little bit of runway behind them and um, uh, have exhibited, you know, really interesting growth characteristics. Um, so my story uh, is that uh, I'm also from Long Island. Uh, went to school in Buffalo as an engineer. Uh, there you go, Buffalo. Big shout out for the Buffalo crowd. Uh, then, uh, after four years in Buffalo, decided correctly go to California and go and work for Intel Corporation. Uh, so I did that. And interestingly, um, I just had the entrepreneurial bug and I went and did a startup um, after a couple of years at Intel on the West Coast. It worked out really well. I was able to afford business school, came back um, and uh, graduated class of 87. Um, one of the things uh, that is interesting to me, I'm, I'm on the board of the National Venture Capital Association. Uh, it's an amazing organization, uh, as you can imagine, incredible group of themselves entrepreneurs, but really the venture capital industry is the backer of many, many um, hugely successful uh, companies here in the U.S. And, and abroad for that matter. Strong ties with a lot of schools, um, most notably Stanford. And, I noticed that a couple of years ago and started talking to Vince about rectifying that because really, if I reflect back on what it was like um, when I was going here, um, you know, you, there was um, some entrepreneurship, but nowhere near the level of where it is today. And, um, you know, and I think Vince and the team here have done an amazing job of bringing Columbia um, to be a world-class, really a world-class business school with respect to entrepreneurship. And uh, the, the difference is striking. Um, and I think directionally, I think the school has the potential to be every bit, uh, you know, the leader in the entrepreneurial ecosystem as, as a Stanford, as a Harvard, or any of those schools. Um, so 
looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And uh, I just want to emphasize, you know, that one of the key things that Brian said there is, is team. And there's a long legacy here at Columbia. The Lang Center's been around actually for 20 years. So, you know, it's not that we jumped on the, the bandwagon of entrepreneurship recently. It's, 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 I think, to Brian's point, it's always been a part of our DNA, but it's about leveling it up and, and really identifying and celebrating the success, many success stories that we have. And I think this panel is especially representative of all the different types of success stories we have. We have science, we have consumer products, we have big businesses, um, international businesses. Um, so I think this, this panel is very representative. Um, very interesting backgrounds for everybody. What I want to do, Tom, I'll start with you. Uh, during your intro, you talked a little bit about making the transition from, I think you said tax forms to wines. Um, I know when I do my taxes, I want to drink, but I've never actually started, started a business um, from that, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you made the transition uh, or more specifically how you knew it was the right time to start your business, to quit your job and start your business? Sure. Um, let me just start by saying it's amazing how, if you, as you look across the table here, there's so many products that, that are here to help people and to make people feel good. And I think it really goes to the reason why I started the company that I did. And that's because I was really miserable in big corporate America. Um, let's be honest. And uh, there were some discussions yesterday in the family, um, the family uh, panel about that. But, um, you know, I've always wanted to do something on my own. But in the end, I never really wanted to do it alone. Life is about being with people. It's about enjoying what you do. And it's about communicating. Um, I think Professor Wadwell yesterday um, had an excellent discussion on this topic, but um, love was part of his, uh, his talk. And I was lucky enough to um, uh, go into partnership with a friend of mine that I knew for about 10 years who was in the, um, in the business of, of trading um, currencies for Jamie Dimon in London. And he saw an opportunity uh, to really take advantage of wine moving around the world in a situation that was not very transparent. Lots of people taking advantage of uh, um, import licensing and um, really uh, not providing a efficient supply chain for the product. Um, I was very, um, very uh, ready at that point. I had just gotten remarried, had a child and triplets on the way. So I am now have four kids under the age of of, uh, of 13. It is a startup, and um, <laughs> that's another perspective for me that has been um, a gift, really, because I got to do it again, and um, I live and die for my kids and for what they provide to me, and it's provided me a really good perspective on what I want to do for the rest of my life, because I'm getting older. Um, and I'm in a business that I love and that makes people happy. I mean, it, it's, and nobody's ever wrong. If you like this wine and you like that wine, guess what? You're both right. Um, so it's a fun product for that point of view, too. But back to the point, I, I was lucky enough to find a partner and take the step, which was very, at that point, new wife, new kids, new job. Um, it was a little nuts, really. Um, but I went for it, and I've never looked back. I've, I'm absolutely... Um, ...of going to work every day, and that was not the case. I think if there's anybody in this room that is going to work every day and is not loving it, please look to do something else. I encourage you to do that, because life is too short. So I, um, that's probably... Uh, that's probably enough. There's a lot of other people on the panel here. Thanks, Tom. Um, can you guys hear? I'm going to go without the mic. Um, Yael, you mentioned, you touched a little bit on the, a little bit of the story about starting Red Flower. I want to ask the same question of you. How did you know it was the right time to start your business? When did you pull the trigger and say, I'm, I'm going all in on Red Flower? This works. Yeah. Oh, this works. This one works. Does this work? Yeah. So, so uh, quickly, I think uh, I was fortunate again to uh, be in the right place in the right time, and 
For me, I had a background in the beauty industry, so I had come before Columbia from working at Shiseido in Tokyo. I'd lived in Japan for about four years, and uh, very fortunate to also have an opportunity post my experience at Shiseido uh, to also work at Unilever for Calvin Klein Cosmetics. And I think the, the two experiences together really showed me that the industry, the beauty industry, which is tremendous and, and so relevant, really had a space missing where nobody was addressing a kind of uh, personal approach, an attitude shift, uh, a beauty from within concept. It was very much about the surface. And for you know an industry that is a multi-billion dollar industry to have a white space in it that nobody was really talking about, I don't even know that I would have recognized had I not had that you know momentary issue. Um, small little story, I was skiing Kerchevel, second year of business school. I was one of those people that came from more of a, a background in the arts, so like spreadsheets probably would have given me a stroke anyhow. But I was skiing, so it's a more romantic story. And I lost use of my arm and uh, could not speak for 24 hours. And that there's an interesting thing that happens when you are inside your body and you cannot get out. And I think the value on your senses, on being able to just go back to normal was so powerful for me in, in a way that I don't know that I would have recognized otherwise. So I'm grateful for that experience at that time when the need to create something, which I think Columbia gives you, that rush to entrepreneurship, which I think we all feel, just whether it's within a, within a corporation or within your own corporation, that need to create, to innovate, to change, to shape the world around you, which is so unique to Columbia Business School. Uh, I found my voice through something very simple. You know, in the end, I am making products myself with natural ingredients, but I've given them a kind of power by shifting the way that you interpret the experience of something as simple as lighting a candle, both because we understand the science, which is that so much happens in your brain and your body when you smell certain oils, when you touch certain textures, but also by framing it in a way that people could relate to differently. And I think we were wise and passionate around the idea of emotional connection and feeling in the beauty space. And I continue to drive that shift forward. It's become easier and easier because we pioneered the space. Now the market force has come our way. And really, for me, it's the moment of Red Flower's concept coming together with market forces and seeing the next place as kind of the, the ubiquity of this idea of feeling as a way of approaching beauty rather than looking. So um, I guess my, my timing came at, at uh, an interesting moment and certainly grateful for all that Columbia has done to move those ideas forward. So, Thank you. Um, Nina, I want to I ask the next question of you. So. Tom Flickinger Fine Wines, wines that's, that's a pretty, I won't say easily definable market, but there's history, there's data, there's physical products, beauty products, uh, to a certain extent the same thing. You grow bones, never been done before. How, how, how did you know that EpiBone was a good business decision to go forward with? Yeah, I thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, Oh my gosh, there's so many, my head is buzzing right now with so many things I'd, I'd love to touch upon. Um, I think for me, the idea that the, that the body and our, and our physicality is a source of en endless wonder and beauty is something that I find highly motivating. Um, we all live in bodies that are comprised of trillions of cells that are conspiring every single moment of our lives to keep us alive. When was the last time, you know, we thanked our lungs for giving us our last breath? or our hearts, which are comprised of trillions of cells and beat together in time, trillions of times in a lifetime, never pausing to rest. You know, do we, how much do we really thank our physicality for supporting our lifetimes? Um, so that has been something that has been highly motivating for me as a scientist to try and probe how did we become the people we are? How did those cells become those human beings that comprise us? How did we all start as one cell big and become the people that we are today? Right, think questions like this. And um, these are the scientific questions that 
are motivating for many lifetimes, um, for many types of people. Poets and, uh, and, uh, and artists are as equally obsessed with this question of how we became the people that we are. Um, so for me, it took this form of saying, well, how do I grow a heart in the lab? How do I grow skin? I've grew, I've, I'm sort of a generalist when it comes to <laughs> tissue engineering. I've grown heart, liver, skin, heart, um, heart tissue, neurons, skin, and now with our company, EpiBone. Um, and many people are looking, I think, for a, a sort of aha moment for when, um, when the science became real and, um, or the, the discovery became or manifested. And I think for us, it really, it's, it's just an important thing to note that an aha moment is more like an aha moment <laughs> where you sort of say, well, here's what I've learned today. Wake up every morning, go to work. You're pushing on the edges of what's known. And so that adventure is inherently worth what it is. Um, now, when did we realize that, it, that those bones, those tissues we were growing might be closer to being able to help people? Okay, so that, that is more of an aha moment, you know, saying, okay, well, I've known how to grow bones, I've known how to grow all these kinds of tissues, I've studied them, but we can grow, we can use digital fabrication to control the exact three-dimensional perimeter of this tissue, and in any arbitrary shape, we know how to keep it alive because we know how to do the fluid handling, the fluid mechanics, the, all that engineering stuff that goes into copying nature's playbook. You know, so nature is the tapest, nature is the inspiration. We are the engineers that just try and extract that and put that into practice. And so for us, it was really knowing that we could grow them in three dimensions in any shape we wanted. Um, then, then we said, okay, well, what next? Okay, so if that meant I was, I went and started my MBA. My co-founder went and did a, a pig, a study in pigs to figure out, well, we can grow this in the lab. How do we know that we can grow this and help people? Um, that's been five years since that aha moment. We only started the company in 2014, raised the funds, but it's a very long journey. Um, so I think it's really important to note as scientists who become entrepreneurs that um, that, that aha moment needs to happen every day. Um, you need to have enough stamina to be a workaholic every day and just love what you do so much that you those smaller adventures are, are what keep you up um, and keep you excited. Um, but it, it really was learning that there was a chance that this could apply towards helping people. And then the machinery will, will take a decade to, to accomplish the, you know, finding out if that's true. It's, it's the experimentation. And, and that's what I think is really interesting about entrepreneurship as it relates to science, because scientists are, are in many ways asking similar questions, testing hypotheses, doing all the same types of activities that entrepreneurs do. And many times scientists don't realize that they have that basic skill set in common um, with our friends over at the business school. So I really just want to commend the efforts of universities like Columbia that have really good science and engineering, as well as really good business schools that start to really tie those together, because I think that's an important ingredient is, is getting those different types of minds working together to really translate these types of technologies towards helping people or helping the planet. It's not just about people. It's Earth Day, guys. <laughs> okay. March for Science in case anyone wants to go there later. Yeah. Um, thank you, Nina. Uh, Brian, I'm going to go to you now. So as somebody who makes a living identifying value and identifying opportunities, do you have any, any rubrics? I mean, you must see so many deals, here's so many pitches, do you have any rubrics or, or hacks that you use to, to immediately identify an opportunity versus disqualifying an opportunity? I've never heard it called a hack. That's interesting. I'm the entrepreneurship guy. There you go. <laughs> yes. I have to hack my way into a company. Uh, so, let's see. So, um, I've had the good fortune to invest in over 70 businesses at this point, uh, most of which have worked out, some of which haven't. Um, you know, the loss ratio for venture capital is close to 50%. Uh, you know, needless to say, the younger the company, the higher chance of failure. Um, so as you get further along, lower chance of dramatic outcome, but higher chance of uh, uh, success or getting your money back. Um, so I often get asked the question, you know, is it the entrepreneur, is it the company, or is it the industry? So kind of, is it the is it the horse, is it the jockey, is it the track, right? And I think, of course, the you know, flippant answer is it's all three of those things, um, which it is. I guess my observation over doing this for a long period of time is that the younger the company, the more dependent on the entrepreneur. Um, so, you know, you start out early. I'm sure you all have stories about your original business plan. Tom made the 
comment, throw your business plan out the window, right? And then you hear about the pivot, the invariable, inevitable pivot, right? If I were to ask any of you uh, here on the panel, have you pivoted? I'm seeing the heads bopping up and down because I'm sure you have. Um, you know, if you're a buyout person, if you're investing in a large scale company, you're putting debt on the company, pivot's not such a good thing uh, in that scenario. And so, so I guess where I've kind of concluded is um, obviously it's fundamental, the entrepreneur and the management team are hugely always important, but as the business gets further along, um, it becomes increasingly, increasingly important to think about uh, the company and the industry. You know, for us, if you look at our portfolio companies, on average last year, um, our portfolio companies grew 34% top line, right, average. Anywhere from the low was like a 4% to the high was over 100%. And I attend at my annual meeting, I put it up on a chart and I have the CEO sit there and the guys on the left side of the chart usually leave the meeting incredibly upset and trying to move their way over to the right end uh, side of the chart. But th my point is the US economy is growing at 2% or you know, 2% and change. How, so picking the industries really is not that complicated uh, because there are only a handful of industries that are really growing to that degree. The, the hard part is then figuring out how do you invest, how do you find, you know, the right entrepreneur, the right company within that ecosystem uh, that has the chance for success. And of course, you know, the overall thing is from my, my vantage point, you know, you can't overpay. You can have a hugely successful company overpay for it and have a bad investment. So I think it's, I think the answer is it's a combination of all of those things. Um, and I think it's a very nuanced uh, sort of thing to just like look at it in totality and try to figure out how that all, how the dials all sort of move so that when you make the investment you have, you know, a great outcome on the other side. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Venture capital, one of the reasons why venture capital, probably one of the biggest reasons why venture capital took root in the U.S. is because you know, we have a culture here that accepts failure. You know, culturally speaking, we're, you know, we have a culture that allows people to take risks and doesn't pen, does, does not penalize people for it. But that's not the case globally. Um, it's changing. But, you know, Esther, you, you mentioned starting your business, you know, 20 years ago. Um, you know, can you contrast a little bit the difference between mm -hmm. being an entrepreneur in, in Asia and Hong mm -hmm. Kong with sure. you know, what we've heard from the panel about being an entrepreneur here in the U.S.? Sure. Well, um, being affiliated to a lot of uh, women NGOs and women entrepreneurs associations back in Hong Kong, I'm a strong advocate of women entrepreneurship and women empowerment. And I think the difference between Hong Kong or you know other Asian countries and the U.S. is really the... Um, you know, there's not a lot of support on this notion, women empowerment or women entrepreneurship. Um, because, you know, just being a member of uh, a VP of the Golden Bohemia Women Entrepreneurs Association, a lot of our members, they claim themselves as entrepreneurs, whereas actually they're just managing or in inheriting the family businesses. Or maybe, you know, they just come up with a creative idea to sell a new pair of shoes and then they call themselves entrepreneurs but uh, that's really not the case you know so sometimes you know we, we need to educate them that you know being an entrepreneur is really starting something from scratch uh, one time I gave a talk on being an entrepreneur a woman entrepreneur is to be a fun and fearless female uh, FFF so you have to take that risk not be afraid of failures and of course there are other factors which are uh, hope you know now it's, it's good to see the growing trend in Hong Kong uh, we have a new chief executive coming up imminent who's a female and she's going to be a strong supporter of women empowerment and entrepreneurship you need mentors I always encourage my mentees to find mentors so that they learn from them how they start their business and they can actually handhold them and guide them provide the guidance you also need people with you know, who think alike, right? The support group, the support network, talk to other entrepreneurs, and also finally investors. People who can really appreciate your idea. And nowadays there are a lot more pitching session, a lot more uh, companies that, that they call themselves the incubation center or companies that help entrepreneurships find investors and find sponsors. So that's good to see. Um, how do you know when it's, it's the right decision to take 
venture capital versus bootstrapping your business. Um, you know, I think everybody has different experiences here. You know, if anybody wants to jump in, what's the right decision? It's always the right decision to take venture capital. I don't, I, I kind of, I kind of don't, I don't really get the question. Is there a question there? There, there are many options besides in B, that, that have nothing to do with either VC or bootstrapping. Um, there are angel groups, there are government grants, there are um, high net worth individuals. Uh, there's, there are lots of different um, types of people who could share your mission and could have access to capital that can help further mi your mission. And in our case, we have not yet taken any VC dollars yet. We've raised $11 million so far. Um, a lot of, um, a couple mil a little bit less than two million has come from government grants, so that's non-dilutive funding from the NIH and the Department of Defense. Um, the rest has come from, you know, high net worth individuals and, and small funds, angel groups, and we have a tremendous support network. So we've done it a little bit non-traditionally, um, and um, our investors are, for us, uh, a huge source of, of non-capital <laughs> in addition to capital. So um, one of our investors is actually speaking on the Impact Investing Panel right now, Andrea turner Moffat. She runs a, um, an angel group called Plum Alley that is meant to um, address the structural inequality of um, the, num the amount of investment that's being controlled by female you know, investors. Um, and that's, that's really exciting. That, that's a part of our mission too. We want to have a gender balanced team. We serve, in, we're in personalized medicine where we, you know, if any, if, if, if there was ever um, a reason to, you know, support um, diversity, I think personalized medicine is, is one of those lofty goals. Um, so I just want to offer there's many other, other types of funding sources available to entrepreneurs besides those two things. Now that said, um, we're getting close to clinical trials. We're getting close to the point where the costs start going up. And so, you know, going forward, I think it, it makes that, I think for us, that may be the moment. You know, you asked when the moment is, right? Um, and so I think that might, you know, our Series A is a, good, is a good moment to say, look, we have our first, we're getting to clinical trials where, you know, this is the time for it to have that marquee life sciences VC lead the round to really, at that point, it demonstrates credibility um, and, and it's sort of de-risking, I would say, of the technology as a, it signals a de-risking of the technology to have that type of investor. So um, I, I, I suppose it would be different for everyone, but I just couldn't resist sharing that we haven't yet done either of those. Well, we bootstrapped plenty, but <laughs> yeah. So just uh, briefly to, to, add out, to add on to that, I think that one of the pieces that I find really relevant and important is that any investor decision is really about also thinking about partners and that when and how you decide to raise capital is, you know, I think probably number one primary in, in the success and growth of your company. I would say that uh, I always counsel and, and ask people to think about not just the dollars, but who and, and how can those dollars most impact your business through the, uh, the, the value that the partner brings on. I'm sure you can add to that a little bit. Yeah. No, I think it, 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 if, if we can't add value to your business, then we shouldn't be your investors. And it's critically important. And, you know, the, the business, the venture capital industry has gotten so much more specialized than it used to be. And you, if you dig deeply enough um, as an entrepreneur, you absolutely can find, you know, a firm or a person um, who has direct experience and can really help out your business. It shouldn't just be about the money. And then, of course, the other thing is, I mean, there are some businesses where it's, it's funny, but there are some businesses where it's inappropriate to take venture capital. So, for example, you know, our investors need to get their money back at some point. And some businesses, whether they're family owned or otherwise, that's not the objective. The objective might be totally different. The objective could be, you know, long term creation, um, you know, within a family, um, you know, for multi-generational kind of things. And those, I think, are not appropriate for venture capital, or the structure has to be carefully um, discussed and outlined prior to the investment so that everybody has a clear understanding of what you're in for, how long you're in for, what the objectives are, that sort of thing. You know, I'll, I'll hitchhike on that by saying I kind of like the size of the company that we have right now. Um, I'm also surprised at how much money it takes to run a distribution business like this. The more money we have at our disposal, the bigger we can be. 
And I was, you know, I never learned that in class. I don't know why. But it, money, it, it takes a lot of money to make a, to make a business work. I don't want to give up the, or my partner and I don't want to give up any control. So, and we've also talked about we don't want to get any bigger. We're kind of, we kind of liked where we are and, you know, we're going to uh, continue to do that. A lot of these companies are really, really exciting and um, a different stage in life for me, I think. And, um, um, I, you know, not that I wouldn't take money, uh, but I wouldn't take the control away either. So, I don't so just to add on to that, from a consumer products brand, which is an, you know, an interesting, it is a consumer products company, it's a brand that we've built, I, I felt personally uh, that the, the best approach for our shareholders, one of which is Columbia University, was really to, because we were in a new market, to really focus on uh, limiting the amount of investment that we took in until the market forces were appropriate for a key inflection point. I think that you know, building value in the end, of course, there's the passion, the, the component of the business in, a, in the entrepreneurship, I think it's always, and we've all, I think, represented that here, it's always about a higher purpose. There is something else driving you as an entrepreneur beyond the value, but the value really does need to be there. And for me, I think the idea of being independent was about focusing on building a brand that could stand on its own. And it takes, as you've just said, Tom, it takes time or money or a combination of both and market forces to do those things. And I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's about listening. It's about listening to the environment. It's about listening to where your business is and finding that right point to bring those value pieces together that are going to allow the brand to, in our case, I think we're at a key inflection point where we're, we're really ready to launch the brand into ubiquity, for lack of a better word. But I think that, that took time, and I'm glad I took the time to build it to this place. Point. Um, I think you know, being a mom entrepreneur, I think you know, it, it's it's really I focus on my lifestyle more than you know just ultimately get, getting an investor or selling my business because one of the things you know is I, I hope one of my daughters can take over, be a successor, and uh, I remember two companies approached me uh, to to acquire Prestige or invest a uh, fifty one percent. I said no, actually I, I do want to maintain that autonomy. I do want to have a more flexible schedule so that I can send the girls to school, I can pick them up from school and maintain that, you know, flexibility and autonomy. Um, so I think, you know, entrepreneurship is a lifestyle, is, is, is a way of how you want to live your life. And I think for me, even if I'm running two businesses, family always comes first. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing panel, as you can tell. This could be a five-hour conversation, but I, I, was, I was instructed to make sure we stay on time. So I want to make sure that we leave uh, some time towards the end of this conversation for the audience to ask some questions. So I'm going to shut up and uh, see who in the audience has some questions for the panel that they'd like to ask. Yes, sir. son and one is myself. Uh, I don't want to confuse my son. I think he finished in 97 and um, he really doesn't like my business which is international. But as I spoke to Brian, uh, one of the things that amazes me, everybody sitting here, and I have yet to see over the last five years any emphasis on doing business in the last market region of the world, which is Africa. There's 160,000 African millionaires who have accumulated cash. They're not going to invest in Wall Street instruments. There's a market set there. As I end my career, I've been trying to find the right people to get in on the ground floor. And it doesn't mean that uh, you have to be an African or an African American to do business in Africa. Brazil, Russia, and China is doing business. So my question is this, that market is sitting there and you multiply that by eight in a family, you're talking about close to a million people whose fathers are millionaires with cash. And they're no longer traveling to the United States for medical treatment and it, it's a 16 hour flight. So what I'm looking at the young people, I haven't seen anything focused on market opportunities in Africa with this market clientele 
And I've been trying to give the damn thing away. I'm at the end of my career. And I'm, so I want to question for the panel, could they address that issue? Because there's a lot of business opportunity there. But I understand from some of the key uh, key people in the entrepreneurship office that there has been a big investment and focus on satellite programs within the African continent. So I think, Vince, maybe you can speak more clearly on that, but I know that that has been. I've hosted people at Red Flower that have come through that program to learn more and to create integration. So I, I do understand that it is a focus and an important uh, uh, investment uh, for the for the university. Yeah, you raise a good point. I mean, one of the one of the challenges that we have with entrepreneurship is that it covers every industry, it covers every stage of business, and it covers every geography. And what we've very consciously been doing is exposing students either through programming or through individuals or anecdotes about the opportunities there. And just to give you one specific <coughs> anecdote, and then I'd actually like to, to open it up for more questions. Is um, you know we have. Eight entrepreneurs and residents. These are these are successful business people. They most of them have either transitioned or are still CEOs and founders of large companies. Um, they're very strategically picked to represent either industries or areas that are, are growing. And we actually have uh, Austin Okari uh, is an African entrepreneur. He's one of our entrepreneurs and residents dedicated. He actually travels over here twice a year. And for the week that he's here, he does a whole series of workshops and lectures on the opportunities there, tells the story. And then we have many other alums who come back and, and, and talk about that. So really what we teach is how to identify opportunity and then sort of expose people to the areas where that opportunity exists and we can let them go from there. I just wanted to make a small comment about um, yeah. personalized medicine and how it relates to our business. Yeah. Oh, they're both dead. I'll just scream real loud. Um, yeah, so... Um, one of the things, one of the, um, the beauties of personalized medicine is that it really relates to the individual person. And, and humans, although we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA across, you know, any, the person sitting to your left and the person sitting to your right, there are tiny, tiny differences in our DNA that have huge impacts on how we metabolize drugs and how they affect us. And so um, I come from a global family. I have cousins who grew up in Africa. I did um, my um, international seminar in Africa, I will say. And so it's something that's important to me just as a human to make sure that we're not, we don't have blind spots when it comes to treating our fellow humans. Um, I, so I've actually been interested in exploring potential, um, for me it means um, looking for what's interesting about different populations throughout the world. And when it relates to bone health, actually, there's some really interesting um, pieces of information that we've learned about, um, about, about Africa. So there are certain conditions that here are very are rare. Um, we call them orphan diseases, and those tend to be the diseases that are underserved here. Um, there's an example called avascular necrosis. It's a, um, a disease where the vasculature retreats from the bones and they don't heal as well. This is a condition that's not that's considered an orphan disease here in the United States, but is highly prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa because it is a, um, a side effect of um, certain HIV medication. So I've actually spoken to folks at NGOs specifically to try and address this need um, in the African population. and um, it, it, the, the struggle is, and so I would love to meet any of these potential these people who are interested in investing in technology um, specifically for the African market because I've also found that, you know, it's what people tend to say to people like me, and I've talked to folks who do a lot of work in other diseases that are considered orphan diseases but are highly prevalent in Africa, who shall not be named. Um, and, and the advice that I've been given is develop your product in the United States and then bring it there. But as a global person who's ancestors come from the entire globe. I just don't find that answer to be very satisfying. And so I'm specifically looking for opportunities to, to make sure that we don't just say this, you know, build it here and then map it out. I'd really love to um, have a strategy that does incorporate um, global, a global strategy. And Africa is certainly high on my list, so I wanted to say that. Um, and to invite anyone who has, who knows people who are specifically interested in that to get in touch with me because personalized medicine is about addressing ourselves as the ecosystems that make up each individual person because we all contain multitudes. And then also recognizing that by extension, um, we are all unique individuals who deserve the same um, access to care as well as the, the best care possible. So don't want to have that blind spot personally. Thank you. Yes, question about 
trying to leverage the scale of potential partners. A couple of occasions where I've had conversations about not having a larger company invest, but giving us access to their their customer base, and it's accretive to them. But getting their commitment is one of the toughest things. You know, only on a couple of occasions have I even gotten to the point of speaking to someone about you know past the third level of basically these are long conversations. Have any of you tried to try to leverage a larger partner's scale and either succeeded or ran into a wall that taught you a lesson? Um, yes, I've seen it. So, for example, if I understand the question, the question would be. You, your company, your product, and you have a larger organization, perhaps their sales force, uh, and some, they're in some sort of a related business, related customer base, and that's the question. Um, my short answer is I've seen companies many, many times um, try to do it, and I've rarely seen it work. Um, fundamentally because, you know, the you get down to the salesperson at the larger company, and they are single-mindedly focused on selling their own products and they're motivated to do it and even if you commission them and do whatever else it's like you know number 11 on their top 10 list of things to do so yes well, I can answer the question since I was a small company and now we have a big company the answer is if you can embed your product in their product so you don't have to deal with that issue it will work and if you don't it's more difficult yes question um, so, in, on panel discussions in school and books, um, when people talk about entrepreneurship, you always hear about how great it is, the freedom, the growth potential, <laughs> this and that. Um, I, I think there's a small, maybe growing body of research on the sort of flip side of that. The stress, the sleepless nights, the credit card debt, the uh, <laughs> terrible part of it. Yeah. I was wondering if some of you might want to discuss the, the nightmare side and <laughs> how, how it's going for you. I, I'm sure there's lots of stories. I just want to make one quick plug for you know, at the Lang Center. It doesn't show up anywhere on our success stories, but one of the things we very consciously started doing over the last couple of years is exposing students to the realities, the exact realities that you talked about. because. You know, we're doing them a disservice if we pat them on the back and say, yeah, go do it, because at the end of the day, anybody who's in here, anybody in here who's an entrepreneur knows that it's a lot of what you said. It's chaos, it's uncertainty, it's volatile, it's stressful, it's sleepless nights, it's arguments with your partner, you name it. Um, so we work that into our programming here for that very reason. So that way, the people who, at the end of two years of business school, still know that they want to be entrepreneurs are the ones who are going to do it anyway. And the ones who don't, we've given them the opportunity to make the decision to maybe go back to their sponsor company or take a more corporate job for now, and they can make that decision later on. So something we're, we're very conscious of here. Um, Quickly, two things. One is laying people off. It is the most uh, heart-wrenching thing you can do. It is, it, 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 you have to do it if you're in a downturn. Uh, hopefully, you're going back on an upturn. That is real. It's... It, those are sleepless nights. The other is the government. Particularly in my business, it is constant. It's constantly changing. Big companies constantly squeezing us out through, through their relationships with politicians that we can't afford to do. And I just hope that someday uh, that'll stop. But uh, I think the government gets in the way a little bit too much. So that's what the sleepless nights are for me. I'm sure we all have yeah. things to add. Yeah. Go ahead. I don't want to dominate this panel, but I will say that um, stress, uh, uh, just from a biological perspective, um, stress is um, it is a response of the sympathetic nervous system, and so as <laughs> and I, I try and stay present with that idea when I'm experiencing what what can feel like a panic attack in response to these external. Um, situations, whether it's the uncertainty of where our funding is going to come from, the uncertainty of our next animal study, you know, all those existential threats. Um, and so I, I have, I will mention that, I, I mean, while I was doing my PhD, I also uh, became a certified yoga instructor and we incorporate in our company, it's, we have a lot of fun incorporating 
um, our yoga into our office culture, um, you know, whether it's by um, learning about bone anatomy through um, movement and things like this. It's sort of a, a fun thing we do on the side. Um, but I, I do think that, that one, one, one of the ways that you combat stress in, in the yogic practice is to try and connect with the sympathetic nervous system. Um, headstands are really great for that, so you'll often find me before important meetings standing on my head somewhere. Um, it's happened. I've been caught. Uh, now I'm less shy about it. Um, but what I really think that um, that speaks to is so the standing on your head, you know, it, it trips the baroreceptor response in our vagus nerve and all of that. But I think what it really also does is shift our perspective, which is um, what the really important thing to do is, you know, I like to say when I stand on my head, the answers fall into it. <laughs> But, but really, when we shift perspective, that's when we start to get a handle on what stress really means. So getting outside ourselves in whatever way that means and flipping a picture around to see what, how it looks a little bit different when we shift our perspective. I think this is the key uh, weapon that we have when we think about stress. Stress is not something that happens to us. Stress is something that our body creates in response to external stimuli. So just reframing. I think the uh, journey of entrepreneurship involves a lot of... Um, how you manage stress, right? How you manage your spouse, how you manage your team. A lot of entrepreneurs fail because they don't know how to manage the team. So it takes a lot of, you know, trials and errors. Uh, and of course there are sacrifices because, you know, if you're passionate about your job like me, I work 24-7, 7 to 11, even during my vacation, but it's my passion, you know? Every day I wake up with new ideas and I just do it. Uh, so efficiently and so productively, and that tells you how to manage time. And I think I kind of, you know, become a good role model for my daughters too, how to manage time efficiently and productively. And there are sacrifices. I sacrifice sleep. I only sleep four and a half hours every night. Uh, but I de-stress through exercise and through sports. Uh, throughout my 22 years with Prestige, I lost three babies. I had three miscarriages. So I learned to be, how to be resilient, and that's how I manage life and an entrepreneurship. So it's great that everybody's talking about stress, so thank you. I think that, you know, what, what we do, and I've often questioned myself because, you know, my family, there's, you know, there's, not, there's no business people in my family. My father said when I graduated from business school, so he was a uh, you know, World War II survivor, came from Bulgaria, communist country. I have rabbis and farmers and nobody's in business. So I think there's a, an idea for me of being the first in my family to be in business and uh, the, the challenges I think that uh, you face in business are you have to, the desire is there, the passion is there to shift the way people live. So again, I think that when you're doing something that feels overwhelming, you settle back into the idea of the higher purpose. And it pushes you forth in a way that is so motivating that the challenges feel worth overcoming. And I think everybody's life is challenging. It's not unique to entrepreneurship, and I think the risks are certainly higher. The willingness to take decisions are probably bigger, and the ability to lead effectively and to kind of answer many needs that you might not have to in a traditional role are, are worth overcoming. And I think, you know, we've all found ways of, of um, I think in a world that is more and more and more stressful, you know, I, I happen to have uh, made my own, uh, you know, easier than standing on my head, which I'd probably fall over because my legs are so long. Uh, but yeah, this, this idea of just something as simple as taking a bath, as lighting a candle, Red Flower is really created to answer that universal need. And I, um, I do find that those simple things of decompression can change the way you feel and add a lot of longevity to the will to push through, whether it's through, you know, standing on your head, limited sleep, finding someone else to, you know, you come from a tax and audit background, so those administrative pieces, I'm sure you handle, you know, better than most of us here, you know, so I think finding those tools and then relying on them. It's a great question, and I think being honest is, is important. Yeah. answer that in one word or two words, I have to end the panel, so. I have a uh, partner who's a Christian, I always <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a one word. Yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a good thing. I think it's hard. I think you may come to better conclusions with multiple opinions. Thank you to the panel.